today uh, Ernani is going to talk again about uh, gradient Richard Sultans in dimension four. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mustaf. Uh, the sound is good. Everyone yeah. listen well. Perfect. Yeah. Sound and video, very good. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you. So, uh, that just uh, we call where you stop the last lecture. We, in the last lecture, we talk about uh, some facts about compact rich solitons. And we did a list. First property is that it's necessarily, let me put like this. It's necessarily gradient type. We can use the dependent theorem to guarantee that we can replace the vector field by a gradient vector field. We also said that lambda must be necessarily positive, which means that if it's compact necessarily, it must be a shrink type. And uh, we also mentioned that the dimension must be bigger than equals to four. In dimension two and three, they are trivial. And uh, you said that the scalar character must be positive. And uh, finally, the first fundamental group must be finite. So this is, this is a, are one of these the, the properties of uh, four dimensional or n dimensional compact rich solid. So, one of the examples that you mentioned last uh, talk is one example obtained by Haydn Sal and independently by Nario Koizo around nine minutes that says that CP2 connects them with minus CP2 is the same complex projective plane, but we have uh, inverse orientation. This is the first example of rich soliton on a compact manifold uh, obtained by then. This is a non-trivial one. So the second one, In dimension four was obtained by Wang and Zhang, which means they blow up into points. It's given by this example. And they are the only known examples of compact which is sort of non-trivial dimension four. Uh, there are there are the generalizations for high dimensions, of, of course but we are interested in dimension four. They are the only examples, thing, but if you observe that they are scalar manifolds. So we don't know uh, uh, a Riemannian example uh, uh, instead of these no examples. Then I can now, announce the first problem, first open problem. It's a question uh, proposed by Raidon Sal, which says that the question is, if it is possible to prove that if we have a compact which is soliton, then it's necessarily a Keller one. This is a question. Uh, there are two ways to uh, analyze this problem is try to obtain a new example of four dimensional compact rich solitons, a Riemann one, or maybe remove the, the Kelly condition by some weaker condition, or try to prove that they, these two examples are the, the, the only possible. We know in the Kelly case, they are the only possible, but 
it's interesting to prove that in general, they are the only possibility to, uh, to uh, example of compact which is solid. So let me uh, let leave this problem here. So this is an open problem. So another thing interesting is a comment here that I'd like to, to mention before to go to the, the, the word that you mentioned for is it's very easy to show that compact rich solitons we have constant scalar curvature is is Einstein. And it's possible to prove it's trivial. The proof is very simple because it's only necessary to use the trace of the fundamental equation. This, this is in any dimension, okay? So if the scalar character is constant, then you can send this guy for another side, then this becomes lambda minus R, then this is a constant. And it's just necessary to use the Hopf lemma or the Hopf maximum principle lemma to conclude that F must be constant. Then we return to the fundamental equation, it becomes uh, Einstein. So, however, if you assume non compactness, uh, this is not necessarily true. For example, the example that I mentioned here in the first talk. In the, the cylinder example has constant scalar curvature, but it's not trivial. Uh, the same in the, the Gaussian soliton, we has uh, constant scalar curvature equals to zero, but the potential function is not trivial, but it's Einstein, okay? But it's not trivial. So uh, one, one interesting question is about the uniqueness of uh, gradient shrink rich solitons with constant scalar curvature. And now, of course, in non-compact case, very recently, the, this uniqueness, this question was answered by Zhou and Shane. They proved that the uniqueness in dimension four. In dimension four, you have a complete gradient shrink of salt with constant scalar curvature. They must be uh, or the cylinder or the Gaussian solid or Einstein examples, or the generalized uh, cylinder must be one of these. Why? It's a very interesting uh, result proved by then, but it remains open for dimensions bigger than equals to five. Okay, it's another question I'd like to, 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 to leave here. So, it's very nice, it's very interesting to see the proof obtained by then. Uh, the idea is very interesting. So, now I'd like to focus on dimension four. Huh? Uh, to do that, On four manifolds. To do that, it's not, it's interesting to introduce some basic properties that is only true in dimension four. For example, on four manifolds, we 
we have the decomposition of the curvature tensor R I J K L given by a term which essentially is the trace free part of the decomposition of the curvature tensor plus another terms. Another terms. Let me just write this correctly. Plus the rich curvature with this indice, plus the rich curvature with this another indice, JK minus RIL, JK minus R. J K J I L plus uh, minus the scalar curvature divided by six times J J L J I K minus J I L J J K. So these are the composition of the curvature tensor in dimension four. This term here is the rich curvature. Because I have the scalar, the, 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 the R, we, we have two indices. And this guy are the metric. Okay. All here's are the metric. It this R without indices, this is scalar curvature. In other words, when you think about rich soliton, we know that the rich curvature is obtained by the fundamental equation, and the scalar curvature is obtained taking the trace of the fundamental equation. In uh, Hope is speaking that if you have a rich solid equations, I, I already have the information about the rich in the scalar curvature. Of course, depends on the potential function, you need to do some computation, it's not too directly. However, we have this information. Good or no, uh, but we have. Then what do we, we need to analyze our target should be this one. Because this term, we don't have this term. This term represents the trace fee part of the value tensor. And in his call, the value tensor. It's natural to put this guy as our target because they, they are not the terms we already have by fundamental equation. Then it's natural to look in for him. This is a very important tensor in Riemann geometry. One of the reasons that W is the value tensor, it is trace-free in any indices. If you, have the if you take the trace for any indice, this trace becomes zero. Another important is because W is equal to zero, for dimension less than or equals to three, then this guy vanishes in dimension two and three. But we we are interested in dimension bigger than equals to four, then it is a, a very good target for us. So another important information is for dimension bigger than or equals to four, we say that M4, I mean, the manifolds, no? is locally conformally flat. It's locally conformally a uh, uh, Euclidean metric if the biotensor vanish. It's, it's, it's the more natural assumptions to consider. If you want to remove this guy, it's natural to assume that this guy is, is zero. And in specific dimension four, we have some interesting properties that comes from the fact that the bundle on a on a oriented four manifold, the bundle of two forms, I denote this. Uh, lambda square can be invariantly decomposed 
Mas a direção... Like this. Lambda square is lambda plus, lambda minus, okay? Or these guys, lambda plus and minus, let me put above this. A minus is the corresponding eigenspace of the hot star operator. Okay, this is the composition. It's very important in dimension four. It's a very useful information. You want interesting fact that this is the composition. This is the composition is conformally valid. If you take another metric conformal to the initial metric, this decomposition is invariant by this uh, change of metric. Okay, so uh, one interesting fact As a consequence of this, we, we have this decomposition for the value tensor. The value tensor can be decomposed also as a direct sum. What do we have now? Two terms. In other words, double is a endomorphism. of the, the bud of two forms. So, and the, and the, each piece here, this guy is the self-dual or self-dual part of the value tensor, okay? This the composition is said, uh, double plus is, I can define double plus, double minus to be defined lambda M lambda, M and this guy here are the self dual and and self dual part of the value tension. So Just to compare with what we did here, for a dimension bigger than equals to four, we know that a manifold is locally conformally flat, the value tensor vanishes. Uh, one example of locally conformally flat manifold is of course the Euclidean space, a sphere. Uh, but if you look now for this, the composition, we, we know there is a direct sum, then not necessarily the two piece must be zero. For example, here, we now may consider another assumption weaker than locally conformally flat. We say that a four dimensional manifold is half conformally flat, If double plus zero or double minus is equal to zero. This is a weaker condition than locally conformally flat because I'm just asking for a piece of the double to be zero. Uh, however, I think it's interesting to point out an example which is half conformally flat but it's not locally conformally flat. In this example, can be for a can be complex projective plane of dimension 
complex dimension two, then the real dimension four. There's a four dimension, okay? In CP2, double plus uh, can be zero and double minus is this character to square divided by 24. And this guy is not zero. In other words, this guy is half conformally flat, but is not locally conformally flat, which shows that in fact, the half conformally flat condition is weaker than a locally conformally flat condition. Okay, let us proceed. In. And uh, if you assume that if you fix a point, if you fix a point P on M and diagonalize double plus or double minus the same the same the same argument, you can go from one to another if you replace the orientation. But if you diagonalize, for example, double plus, such that uh, omega i plus, we have i between one and three are the the respective eigenvalues. In other words, I'm looking for double plus like this, omega one plus, omega two plus, omega three plus, and zero in other parts. So if you have this, and the, we may assume that double plus is less than two, the, Omega one is less than omega two. I have here order three plus. And because the value tensor is trace free and we have a, a direct sum, and we also have that the sum here has to be zero. Okay, I have these two properties for the in value of double. Plus the same holds for double minus. Okay, the same, the same idea we obtain for the double minus. From this property here, it's not too hard to show that in general, if you have a four-dimensional oriented manifold, the determinant of double plus is less than equal to square root of six divide by 18, the norm of double plus, and if the power is three. This is a very interesting uh, inequality, where essentially the determinant of double plus is the, the product of this eigenvalues here. So the same holds for double minus, okay, it's the same, okay, same idea. And this is, will be very, important for us in the in, in the in the lecture. So how you can prove this? The proof is very simple. Let me just give a, a very quickly idea. This is well known for who study dimension four, four dimensional manifolds. This is well known. It's not to is is nothing uh, to uh, not too new. So if you take the, the norm of double plus is because omega one, omega two, and omega three are the age values, we have this uh, equality here. And using that, uh, uh, the decomposition of this, we can write double plus minus W two plus square plus one half uh, omega plus minus omega two plus square plus omega three plus square. Very easy to, to test this, just develop the, the, the square here. So with this, we may assume that this guy is non-negative 
assume that we, we know that it's non negative because we have a square here. Then this is bigger than equals to one half of omega one plus because omega two plus square plus omega three plus square. So, and this guy here, we know that the sum of the three ones must be zero. Then the sum of the two one is equals to omega three uh, plus with this the negative sign. Then this guy can be replaced by omega three plus square because I have a square. Then the sign of minus uh, does not affect in, in in the calculation. So when you sum this, it will be three half of omega three plus. Finally, it is sufficient to use that this information to prove that it's just sufficient to show that it's easy to prove that this happened. Okay, I will let this as an exercise. Okay, it's very simple. Then we can check this for any four dimensional manifold. So, in particular, the equality holds if only if omega one plus is equal to omega two plus. Okay, the first two integer values are equals. Okay. Uh, now, another important information that comes from the decomposition of the of the 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 bud of two forms, dimension four, is the decomposition of the Riemann curvature dimension four. We can we can write the the the, the Riemann operator as a, a decomposition in a matrix four, as a block matrix. And something like rich ball here, rich ball here, and I have here omega minus plus the scalar capital by 12, the identity. And I have this, this matrix where rich ball is the operator rich minus scalar capital divided by four key, which is a guy. If this this property, so this is the, the transpose of of the rich ball. So if you look more carefully, notice that the decomposition of curvature depends also double plus and double minus, and the this guy here. Remember, if this rich ball is equal to zero, this is equivalent to say that such manifold must be Einstein. Then the connection to be two in Einstein four manifolds appear naturally in the composition of the curvature tensor. Okay, so these are some notations that you need to consider for what we will discuss now. So let me now discuss a little bit the topology, rest geometry in this context of dimension four. Uh, we know that by Poincaré duality, we know that for all compact four dimensional manifolds, the oil characteristic, uh, the oil characteristics. And the signature of a four dimensional compact manifold are given by, and let me put in here, the only characteristic and the signature are given by uh, the only characteristic of M is twice uh, minus the first bad number plus the second bad number. And the signature is the 
positive part of the decomposition of the second bad number minus the negative part. What is here are uh, the dimension of the of this this the, the, the bundle of this part of the bundle. Okay, so here B one and B two, which can be the computer as like sum, like this, are the second, the first and second bad numbers. In other words, have here a topological information which does does not depend of the, 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 the there is no a dependence of the the, the, the metric. There's no uh, geometric information here, just topological information. This is only the pain of the, the topology of a given manifold. Okay. So, uh, one consequence of this formula obtained by duality of Poincare is that, in general, if you have a four dimensional compact oriented manifold, then the signature, sorry the Euler characteristic is bigger than equals to the norm of the signature plus twice B1 M plus two. So this is holds in general, if you have a four dimensional compact manifold. So just me, just give some example. Remember that uh, this does not depend of the, the, the the geometry of a, a given manifold depends on the, the topology. Okay, for example, the signature of a sphere, the round sphere, not not necessarily round, but the sphere, is four, is two. The the signature is zero. The only characteristic must be two. The signature of CP two complex projective space must be. Uh, three and the signature must be one. The only characteristic of S2 cross S2 is four and the signature is, is zero. Just to give an idea. In particular, uh, also know that in the case of second bad number, if you look for the decomposition of these guys, we know this must be zero because the second bad number of the sphere is zero. But when you're looking for the same, but by CP2, we know this guy must be one and B minus of CP2 is zero. Okay. That is here a definition very useful in dimension uh, four, which is definite. We say that uh, a four dimensional manifold is definite if he, one piece of this is zero. For example, here, S4 is definite and CP2 as well. But S2 cross S, S2 is not definite because the B, the B plus and B minus must be one in this guy. So, another, uh, let me just put here this remark as two cross as two, B minus as two cross as two, C equals to one. Uh, in particular, this, this approach, looking for the bad numbers, it's very useful when you try to prove some restriction uh, for a given metric in S2 cross S2. That is the classical hop conjecture about the existence of a metric with strictly positive sectional curvature uh, on S2 cross S2. And then if you go in the direction to prove that such manifold must be definite, we can, for example, uh, eliminate S2 cross S2. It's a way to, to investigate this kind of problem about restriction on a curvature, okay? So then just to, 
compare the topology. And now let me compare the topology and the geometry of a four dimensional manifold. There is a beautiful formula for a compact four dimensional manifold obtained by essentially Gauss, Schern, and Bonnet. And this formula, the Gauss, Schern, Bonnet says that the signature, the, 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 the oily character, sorry, the oily character of a four dimensional manifold is equal to one divided by a p square, the integral over double plus the square, the self dual part plus the unself dual part plus the scalar curvature divided by 24 minus one half of the, the rich ball square. Remember that the rich ball is here is a uh, rich ball is the rich curvature minus color curvature divided by 4G. In particular, if this rich ball is zero, uh, a manifold must be Einstein. If Einstein, the rich ball is zero, is, is equivalent to say that. So this formula is, is, is interesting, very interesting in my opinion, because uh, in this side here, the right-hand side, we have some quantities which only depends of the metric. This guy depends of the metric. This guy depends of the metric. This character depends of the metric. And this guy is a combination of the rich and the scalar curvature, which essentially depends of the metric. This is a volume element which comes from the metric. However, for the other side, for the, 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 the left to right side, we have some topological information. This does not depend on the metric. In other words, if you fix a manifold and change the metric, uh, this quantity in the right hand side will be compensated in such a way that this value of this integral will be the same because the all characteristic is a topological invariant. Uh, this is, in my point of view, a very interesting formula for this reason. So that is a, a, a another formula. Uh, proved by Hisenbrush. My pronunciation of this name is not good. I, I think he's a German mathematician, a friend of mine, uh, Daniel Sibotaro, teaching me how to say Hisenbrush, but it's very difficult for Brazilian guys to uh, do this sound. <laughs> uh, okay, but this formula, it's uh, uh, some uh, analogy with the Stern Gauss Bonnet formula. But here we have one expression to the signature. And the signature is the norm of W bar square minus W minus the square. And again, this term of the right hand side only depends on the metric, and the term of the left hand side. Is a topological invariance. In other, again, if you fix the, the manifold, it change the metric. In certain sense, this quantity on the right hand side will be compensated in such a way that this value must be must be the same. So, why this is uh, interesting for us at this moment is because this formulas. imply that if you compute twice the all characters and sum this with three times the signature, we can prove that this is four pi square integral of the twice double plus square minus the scalar character square divided by 24 minus one half the rich ball is square and with the column element. If you replace here minus, the only change here you will be in this term. This will becomes plus, you replace plus by minus. 
Okay, it's great. It's, it's okay. So if you put here plus, this becomes plus above. If you put here minus, this guy inside of W will be minus. An interesting fact is uh, knowing a uh, uh, rich top inequality. The rich top inequality. The heat top inequality, of course, proved by heat in top independently, says that a four dimensional compact oriented Einstein manifold. must satisfy the twice the oracle is bigger than three times the signature. So this is the heat torque inequality. And uh, it's easy to, to, to check from this because in the Einstein case, this term becomes zero. Then of course, the another term is no negative. Okay, so this is the heat top inequality. This inequality is very important in dimension four. One of the reason is because I have a, a topological obstruction to the existence of a Einstein metric. If we have a, a a given manifold, if I'd like to see if this manifold admit an Einstein metric. Then I can look in for this uh, topological obstruction. This only depends on the topology of the SAT manifold. If this inequality does not hold, then we conclude that SAT manifold do not admit uh, an isometric. I think this uh, is very interesting because you are. Uh, we have our own relations between the topology. We give an obstruction to the existence of a geometric quantity because the Einstein metric only depends on the metric. It's okay. This is a very famous uh, inequality. Uh, it's easy to, to, to check in the Einstein case. So, Return to the rich Salton case. Now let's back to rich solitons. One of the information that you know is that the first fundamental group must be finite. We know also the scalar character is, is positive. And uh, one of the consequences of this is that the, the first bet number must be zero. In other words, the, the, the torus is not an uh, example uh, of a, a rich soliton, a compact rich soliton. So then we can guarantee that the Euler character is, is bigger than the norm of signature plus two. In other words, this. It's equivalent to say the, the signature is strictly bigger than the norm of, of signature. This equation, this inequality is already known. It's a consequence of the result obtained by William Wiley and Garcia Hewitt Finance Law on the, uh, the first fundamental group of a given compact rich solid. So, however, this inequality here is different from, from, the, from the, this one, because here I can put three half, this is 1.5, and this is one. Well, one question very natural is to ask about the possibility to improve this inequality and replace here one by three half. So 
let me give you more motivation to, to a question like that. When you return to, to the four dimensional compact rich salt examples, which means CP2 connects them with minus CP2 and CP2 connects them with twice minus CP2. What well, you know here is both examples are Keller. Okay, so he, we also we know the the value of the the bad numbers, and we already know that they satisfy this inequality. They also satisfy the heat top inequality. The knowing examples, but of course, can uh, maybe exist another example that you know we don't know, and this cannot guarantee that. In general, this inequality, this heat top inequality is true, but let me check a little bit more. For example, uh, it's well known as well. A uh, four dimensional compact rich salt. satisfies this formula here. The integral of the normal for rich square is equals to twice the volume of a, this manifold, but plus this integral here. So this is a, a easy consequence of the, the form of the Laplacian of the scalar curvature, which, which is, uh, sorry, and this, this formula here, uh, minus this plus r minus twice the rich square. It's a consequence of this formula that we will prove in, I believe in the, in the second lecture, I think so. So it's just take the integral. But the interesting fact is if you replace this and And this one, what is, what is here? If you replace that here, because we have here the integral of rich ball, then you can change by rich, just a combination. Uh, just uh, remember that rich ball square is equal to rich square minus scalar capital divided by four. Okay, and then if you plug this there, it's not difficult to show that twice the characteristic plus three times the signature is equals to 148 p square integral of twice double plus or minus depending how you can take it here and square plus uh, six. So then we we know that to prove that the heat top inequality holds for a compact rich solid in general, it's only necessary to guarantee that this integral is non negative. One of the ways to do that is to recall one result obtained by the Dzinski around the 85, I think so, 85. He proved that if M4 is a Keller compact manifold, then the norm of double plus square is equal to the scalar curvature divided by 24. This holds for any compact four-dimensional Keller 
manifold. This is a very interesting result proved by him. So we can go from double plus to double minus if you change the orientation, okay? And this, uh, you can do the same. So, but if you plug this here, this term disappear. Then you have just the integral of <coughs> six and this six go outside of the integral, then be the volume, and then this is clearly non-negative. In other words, the results, uh, combining these two results, we know that every compact four dimensional rich solid, four dimensional Keller rich solid. Satisfies the heat top inequality, the only characteristic bigger than three half of the norm of signature. And we know that. But it's necessary to consider the Keller case. This also it's, uh, motivates the problem that I will mention now. There's a, another problem proposed by, sorry, I put here because problem in Portuguese is problema. <laughs> this is problem in Portuguese. Sorry, <laughs> problem. <laughs> so the problem proposed by Haydon Sal is that does the heating top inequality hold for compact four dimensional gradients with solitums? This is another question proposed by him. And I believe that I, I give some the motiva motivation. There are some partial answers to this question uh, in the literature, some answers obtained by uh, Garcia Hill and Fernandes Lopes. Also partial answers obtained by uh, Zank, Zank, as well, Omari Tadano. And very recently, there is a paper by myself, Shane Zo, but he also obtained a partial answer to this question. I will not discuss this uh, partial answer because we, we have no time to, to do that. But I, I believe that if you have some uh, concern or some uh, question about that, uh, feel free to ask me and send me email. Um, um, so let me continue. Uh, but just to 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 say a few words about to continue, let me uh, call attention to this uh, to this uh, this problem here. One information that I forgot to say that is, if you have a rich salt in general, rich salt shrink one because compact all shrink. We can also uh, keep lambda to be one half up to scaling of the metric. And then if you take the trace of the scalar curvature, uh, the, this equation to obtain the scalar curvature of the Laplacian of F, and here you have twice because the dimension is four, okay? If I have a four dimensional gradient compact, which is soliton, uh, this equation holds. Then in particular, if you take the integral here, 
we see that this becomes twice the volume. This because this term is disappear. We have a, a, a Laplacian term, and by Stokes theorem, this is compact without boundary. Then we have only this equation. In other words, let me put this guy for another side. This equals to this. This is bigger than or equals to the scalar curvature, the, the, the minimum volume of the scalar curvature achieved in this manifold. Because it's compact, then the minimum and the maximum value is achieved. So, in other words, this implies that the minimum of the scalar curvature is less than equals to two. Of course, uh, if there's normalization, we, we, we know that. We, we can do that. Uh, but if you replace it here by the maximum value of the scalar curvature, we conclude that the maximum must be bigger than equals to two. And the equality holds in both case, in any case of this, only if the scalar curvature is constant, but if the scalar curvature is constant, it becomes trivial. So then we know that the difference between the maximum and the minimum value of the scalar curvature must be different of zero because or oh, 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 you'll be trivial, you'll be constant. And when you compare with our example and CP2, connect some with minus CP2, of course, up some normalization, we know that the difference is uh, approximately 1.06. Just to call attention that this difference between the maximum and the minimum of this the, the, this this guy uh, I control. So okay, let's now proceed to the non-compact case. Now we focus on non-compact four dimensional rich soliton, but let me say a few words about non-compact rich solitons in general. And later I you uh, consider the just dimension four. Initially, let me recall this proposition. I already mentioned this result uh, early, but let me replace, let, let, let me call attention a little bit more because this is very useful. This is a result of the by the long chain 2009, where he proved that every complete gradient shrink reaches solid. has no negative scalar curvature. Or the word scalar curvature is no negative. And they also mentioned that another result proved by Pigula, Emote, and such guarantee that if there is a point P on M such that the scalar curvature is zero, just an a point, and then set manifold is the Gaussian solid. Just put like this. It's the Gaussian solid. Put like this. Rich flat. And as a consequence, it must be a Gaussian solid. So then, if you are not consider the Gaussian solid, we may assume the scalar character is strictly positive. So, one of the consequences of this is, of course, if you take this normalization of the the scalar the, 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 the rich solid equation. We may also consider this normalization for 
to the potential function, which is knowing the second one here is the Hamilton equation. If this then guarantee that if this scalar curvature is already non-negative in general for a gradient shrink which is soliton, then we conclude that F is non-negative as well because this term is also non-negative, okay? And if you assume that such example is not the Gaussian soliton, F must be strictly positive, okay? Then F is non-negative as well. So this is the initial estimate for the potential function. The potential function is non-negative, okay? Just this is a way to uh, try to prove uniqueness because it's not necessary to look in, for example, if negative potential function, okay? This is one way, but there is another estimate and sharp estimate proved by Haldon Sao and the Tang Zhu in 2010. They proved that if you have a four, uh, 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 any dimensional uh, complete gradient shrink with a solid, uh, n dimensional complete. Gradient shrinking, which is solid. This inequality above can be improved. It can be the potential function is less than or equal to one quarter of the distance function square plus a constant square. Sorry. Here. bigger than equals to one quarter of the distance function minus a constant square or i axis the distance function and c is a positive constant So this is a optimal estimate because when you compare the behavior of the potential function of the Gaussian soliton, remember the, the potential function of the Gaussian soliton is the Gaussian soliton we have potential function f is equals to one quarter of the scalar curvature of the distance square because it's the norm of the position square. So when you compare, we can say this estimate obtained by Haydon Sao the Tang Zhu is it is optimal. Okay. Moreover, we also have the, the potential function is non-negative because the, the, the lower estimate is non-negative. But we have here another more important information is because the set of possible examples becomes uh, small. For example, I cannot look in for examples with uh, potential function with behavior like exponential, for example. It's difficult to, to, to get. Uh, uh, because this estimate gives us, us obstruction for the, the, the existence of other potential functions. We need to look for the, the asymptotic behavior of this potential function and must be uh, similar to the Euclidean one. Okay? So this result proved by then was proved initially by Perman the Grisham pattern, but assume an additional condition. Assume that the norm of the rich curvature is bounded. Now, uh, a remark here is that the result, this result, 
was first proved by Berman by Assum the additional condition that the norm of the rich came true is bound. So in other words, I don't know how Tang Zhu were able to remove this condition and obtain an optimal uh, asymmetry. One of why this, this type of asymmetry are important, one of the, the importance is because you can uh, look for a small set of possible examples. Also, a consequence of this result we have this the weight volume the weight volume of a, a complete uh, gradient shrink solid is finite that is if you have a, a, a n dimensional complete gradient shrink with solid then the integral with this weight here is finite remember this is a complete manifold the volume must be infinity but there is a guarantee that this weight volume must be finite and this information will be very useful for us in the next lecture where they discuss some rigid results and this information will be used a lot and also uh, before to continue as i said this is a very important estimate then let me give a very quick idea how they prove this uh, the estimate is, is the following. I have the potential function is controlled by one quarter of the distance function square uh, plus a constant and, uh, and uh, is bounded also below by something similar, but here with minus. How we can prove, for example, the upper bound, the upper estimate. The upper estimate, it's much simple because when you have this, the richard solitary equation and take this, uh, let me consider this normalization and uh, also consider this normalization one. And uh, one of the information that we already know is that this character of the curvature is non negative. Then, if this character is non negative, then this guarantee from this equation that the norm of the gradient of Nabla F square is less than equals to F. And this is bigger than equals to zero. In fact, is strictly because we can assume that this character is strictly positive to remove the Gaussian solid, but the Gaussian solid also satisfy this equation, then we can keep it. So then it is easy to prove that the norm of the square, the square root of the potential function, the gradient of this function here, the square root of the potential function, this is bounded by one half. This is a simple consequence. With this, uh, whenever f is strictly positive, because of course, we are removing this, this point. So with this, this guarantee, this guarantee that this square root of the potential function is a Lipschitz function.
But if it's a Lipschitz function, then we know that the square root of this function minus the square root of another point, let me fix a point, let me fix now a point x naught, we know this is less than equals to one half the distance function. We know that we have this, this behavior. Uh, then this guarantee that the square root of this potential function minus the square root of this guy is less than equals to the norm of this. And the norm of this is less than equals to one half of the distance function. So then this guarantee square root of this function is one half of the distance function plus this guy here. Okay. So consequently, if you take the, the square, you may guarantee the potential function is less than equals to one quarter of the distance function plus twice uh, f x naught square. So this is a this prove the the upper estimate. Okay, and how about let me change here the color. How about the lower estimate? Uh, the lower estimate is much a little bit more delicate. We need to look more more carefully, and I put here as exercise. <laughs> okay, what it can you can look in if you have some uh, if you have some problems, uh, some trouble when you try to to prove it. I can help you. Just send me an email. I uh, it'll be it'll be very fine to 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 help you. So this this is what I did for today. I think we can stop here. In the next uh, lecture, we will discuss specifically the uniqueness results and four dimensional manifolds and not necessarily compact. We will focus in complete, not necessarily compact. And I uh, will also present more some open problems. Today, I, 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 I present two open problems. And I believe in the next lecture, you show more two or three open problems. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? All right. Um...